Hallelujah. The Spirit of God is, is applying the cross to our life, and it's such a wonderful thing. The Bible says in, in 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is what? Of Born of God, and what? Knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. And that's such a powerful statement to me. What it means is that what we have is not true love. Amen? <laughs> what we have is, is something else that is based on what we can get, what we can receive uh, in and of ourselves. Uh, you know, it's not selfless. And the love of God is a selfless love. And it's something that's born in us when the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of us. Can you say amen? amen. The Spirit of God is so powerful in, in bringing us into every dimension that God has called us to be in one step at a time. It's not that you can't, uh, don't get discouraged. If you come to the Lord, His Spirit comes and lives on the inside of you on Sunday, Monday, you're not going to be perfect. Amen. And God's taking that into consideration. He knows that you're going to make mistakes, that you're just a human being, that you have problems, you have issues, and you've got to go through processing. Do you understand? God is not judging you just because you have problems. Some people just feel so bad and so condemned because you have problems. But God is not judging you over your problems as hard as you really think he is. He's loving you through your problems. Amen. Amen. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Say the power, the power of God, God. unto salvation. salvation. See, this is why they didn't like Paul's gospel, because Paul preached a powerful God. <laughs> See, what we preach in religion is powerful people. Touch not, taste not, handle not, don't smoke, don't chew, don't hang out with those who do. Don't do anything wrong, and you'll get to heaven. Well, that's not the truth. Gospel is that he did it for us, amen? amen. And he did it as us. And it's a wonderful thing that when he was crucified, we were crucified with him. And every judgment that God has concerning you, the Bible, the Bible says that Christ bore your judgment. The, your, the chastisement for you to have peace was upon him. And by his stripes, your relationship with God was healed. Amen. Whatever condition you're dealing with, you said, are you saying that I can be a sinner and the Lord will still love me? You can't be anything but a sinner. You understand that? The Bible says we've all seen and come short of the glory of God. We're not perfect. Do you know, you, you know what I'm saying? And we're preaching a gospel that's based on what you do instead of based on what he did. He said, I'm not ashamed of the good news of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God to save you. Amen. I love that word, saved. Because saved means that I couldn't do it myself. If I'm drowning, you get what I'm saying? You throw me a, a, a life vest or something that will save me, jump on in and pull me out. Because I'm drowning. Amen? I need some help. Anybody need any help in here? Hallelujah. God's looking for people who need help. He's not looking for perfect, self-righteous Pharisees. He's looking for folks that, that are like you and me that have some problems. Amen? But that's all right. Because he's with us. See, some people think that you've got you've to gotta change and become good and perfect to come to God. Well, if you ever become good and perfect, you won't need to come to God. Amen? You come to him because you can't change yourself. The Bible says, while we were without strength, Christ died. Can you hear me? When we were without the ability to change ourselves, Christ died. And so while we're preaching the gospel as the power of you to change yourself, God said it's not about that. It's the power that I have to change you, to save you, to help you, to restore you, to forgive you, and to make you everything that you're called to be. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His love is, is salvation. It's free. Say free. 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 I said this a long time ago, but some people really need to hear it again. Free means that it costs you not that much. <laughs> what? 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 Now, if I went to a play 
place. And that place, people said, free sandwiches. <laughs> Touch somebody and say, free sandwiches. Free sandwiches. Now, if I went to a place and they said, free sandwiches. Free. <laughs> Hallelujah. Free sandwiches. And then when you got there, they said, it only cost a dollar. Are they liars? Yes. What if I got there and they said it only cost 50 cents? I, 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 I. They say these are free sandwiches. Come to our shop. And you get there and they say it only cost a penny. I, I, I. A hate penny. I, I, I. A quarter of a penny. I, I, I. Give me the lint out of your pocket. I, I, I. It cost you what? Nothing. What? Nothing. What? Nothing. That's some good news to me, baby. Yeah. Good news to me. Good news to me is that it's for free. Yeah. It's either for free or it's not for free. You say, well, brother, you can't do that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. The truth is, free is either free or it's not free. So you've got to determine whether it's free or not. Amen. Yeah. It's a, you have to pay me this in 50 years. But well, that's not still free. It still costs you something. Yeah. That, that's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is the power of God to save me. And I, he don't need me to help me save me. Yes. Can you get what I'm saying? Yeah. What do you mean the power of God? What it means is that he changes your nature. You begin to desire the things that God desires naturally. Yes. You begin not to desire the things that he hates and despises naturally. He loves you. He accepts you in unconditionally. And then he says, now that I'm on the inside of you, let me show you why you don't want to do that. Amen. Let me explain to you and give you understanding as to why I don't like that. And the truth is, when you get his wisdom and understanding, you won't want to do that. Amen. I gave this illustration before, and I know somebody really needs to hear it. If I had a sandwich, I don't know, maybe I'm hungry, I'm thinking of sandwiches. <laughs> And you had a long day, you hadn't eaten anything for some several hours, and this sandwich comes in. What kind of sandwich do you like? Chicken sandwich. You know who's gonna say chicken? Pastrami steak sandwich. Just a real delicious looking sandwich. A roast beef sandwich with cheddar cheese and avocado. Glory to God. God is a good God. Okay, now say, say for instance, I had that delicious sandwich sitting right in front of you, you know, in front of you, and then I tell you, I don't want you to eat that sandwich. And you says, God is holding something from me. He hates me. He doesn't want me to eat that sandwich. He knows, you know, that I want that sandwich and he wants me to starve. You know, God doesn't just want to keep, he says, I'm not going to keep any good thing from you. The Bible says every good and precious gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. God, hallelujah, yeah. doesn't have any darkness within himself. Yeah. No. no evil. Everything he does is for you. He is selfless. Yeah. See, we've got this image in our mind that needs to be torn down. Can you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. We've got an image of God that's been put there from religion, but it's not truly his image. That's right. yeah. His image is in this book, amen? His image is in his spirit. And, his, and he is unconditional love. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. Now he says to you, Brother Jermaine, I know you really want that sandwich. <laughs> but let me tell you something. You think you want that sandwich, but you don't really want that sandwich. Jermaine's mouth is watering. He's saying, no, Lord, you're wrong. I want that sandwich. And he says, Jermaine, I'm trying to tell you, you don't really want that sandwich. Jermaine's like, I can't see it. It just seems like you're being cruel. It just seems like you're being mean. It just seems like you're keeping something from me. And God says, lift up, Jermaine, the top bun or the top slice. And he lifts it up. And he sees a big, 
juicy, delicious looking caterpillar crawling across the lettuce that had been sliced in two as the sandwich had been cut in two. And he looks at it and God says, do you want the sandwich now, Jermaine? As the juices of the caterpillar run between the lettuce leaves. And you know what he says? You are right, Lord. I don't want that sandwich. He says, look in the refrigerator. There's one just like it without a caterpillar. That's how life is with us. We think God is evil and that he wants something bad for us. But he only wants your good. Do you understand? If he's keeping something from you, ask him why. He'll show it to you. If he says, don't, you don't want this right now, ask him why. It may look like a delicious sandwich. But the truth of the matter is, if you look a little closer, he does not, he, he doesn't just not want you to have it. He knows that if you really knew the dynamics of what you're dealing with, you wouldn't want it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you get what I'm saying? Amen. And he knows that we can't see. Even after we live, walk with the Lord for a while, we still know in part and prophesy in part. We still see a lot of things through glass darkly, you understand? And so what he says is, I love you, even if you eat the sandwich. You think it's going to hurt God for you to eat the caterpillar? No. He's going to hurt with you as you crunch through the, you know, lower intestines of that caterpillar, you know, and you find yourself sick. He's going to be sad for you. It's not going to affect his heavenly throne. For you to eat that caterpillar, he's saying it because he loves you. He wants to help you. You get what I'm saying? We still preach this big fiery grill. God wants to barbecue your soul forever. Saute it on this big charbroiled grill with butter and olive oil, a little basil. It's just not true. Read, he said, well, the Bible says right here is that scripture. It says it right here somewhere that he wants to saute my soul forever while I'm screaming and writhing in pain for billions and billions and zillions and trillions and quadrillions of years. Screaming, begging for mercy and finding none. Because I made a mistake. That's not true. That's not true. Wait a minute, that's church doctrine. I know it's in here somewhere. Look at, look, 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 at, look at it further. Look at it further. He says, well, brother, you're a T. I've preached it for years. I could preach hell till fire you. <laughs> Fill it under your feet. Ah! Ah! Cook the altar. God's going to burn you. Ah! People scream. Cook the altar, please, Lord. Forgive me. They're not really saying forgive me. They're really saying don't burn me up forever. <laughs> you know? This fear is like a little joke. Do what I say. I'm going to cut you. I'm going to burn you. <laughs> right? That's what we do. God's gonna burn you. God's gonna burn you. Hitler burned thousands and thousands and thousands of people, you know, during the Holocaust. And he said he's such a evil person. But God is gonna burn up and saute forever zillions and quadrillions, trillions of people. It's just not true. You've heard it and you learned it wrong. I'm trying to tell you, a lot of our doctrine in hell came from Greek mythology. Because Paul preached to the Greeks and Greeks used the word Hades. You understand? To describe death in the place of the dead. But it also correlated with the brother of Zeus and Poseidon. The god of the dead who look just like the picture that Christians have of this devil with a red, you know, jumpsuit on and a pitchfork. We'll go into it. I've got some doctrines on it. Get the, get the tape back there. You know, where's the grill? We've got, we've, we've taught on it very thoroughly. Do you understand? Gehenna, which is the valley of Gehenna, which is, which is translated hell, and, and, the, and Hades is translated hell, but it's not really what we're thinking and what we've been taught that it is. And that's why we've made God's good news into bad news, and people are afraid of God. But the truth of the matter is God is love, and, and the only reason he wants to come into your life is to help you. Amen. 
He said, he wants to kill me. Let me tell you something. You're dead already and you don't know it. <laughs> if you don't have him, you're dead already. Jesus said, those that don't believe on me, you're dead already. You understand? You're only reaping the ramifications of your own condition. God is coming in not to judge you. But he said, what did Jesus say? I came into the world not to condemn the world, not to judge the world. John 3, 17. But that the world, he said he came not to judge the world, but that the world by him might be saved. Do you understand? He took your judgment. He loves you. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Nobody on this earth that does not know God loves you. I don't care how much you think it's love. And that's why when you see the love of God and the love that's coming through people whose heart has been really changed by God, it doesn't look like anything you've ever seen. Wow. And you always want to question it. You almost want to think, oh, is this person, I don't know, what, what is the agenda? Because it's so selfless. That's what the Lord told us a long time ago. He says, the love that I'm going to produce in these people are going to be so pure that people will come in and they're not going to even be able to understand what it is. Right. Because they've never seen it before. Yeah. God is putting something on the inside of us. That is so powerful and so supernatural. And it is true, genuine, God love. And it's amazing. Wow. And only since we've been in Christ do we realize, man, I didn't really love anybody except myself. Yeah. 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 All my life, I did everything I did for me. Amen? But his love makes us whole. And when we really get a big picture and a glimpse of the cross, and we realize that his love is there to change our hearts and to bring us closer to him and closer to one another, you know? Yeah. It helps us love others. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, I... Just so many things are coming, you know, uh, our way. And, and I believe that the Lord wants to bring us just from just an understanding uh, of the cross to an application of the cross. See, people just believe that Jesus died for you, but he died as you. That means that you died with him. Do you understand? And what he did is he put a death to death the old man. He put to death that old man of sin that's caused you all your pain in your life. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The pain that you've caused to yourself and the pain that you've caused for others, you know, and the pain that they've caused you. He's put everything to death. All things were judged in him, and we've been resurrected into the new creation. He says, I've died, been buried, and resurrected. Yes, in Christ. Because he died, he's buried, and resurrected. Death to an old man and a resurrection of a new man is what he's talking about. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, how does that apply to you? I've said it before. He brings the cross to your heart. See? He crucifies you on the inside as you walk out your salvation with him. He shows you the man of sin. He shows you that the man of sin should be dead. He deserves to die. And he helps execute. Yeah. Yeah. And you help him. Because when he decides to execute a certain part of you and bring it to death, he brings you to agreement with him. He brings you to the agreement of the truth. What does he do? He pierces your faith in your head. He mars your face. The Bible says Jesus was beaten in the face with sticks, with rods. They put a crown of thorn on his head, piercing his head. They pierced his hand. They pierced his feet. And they pierced his side. So you've got to go through all of those processes. As the weight of God's chastening crushes down upon the back of that old man and brings him to a death and brings you into newness of life. Yes, but he says, my face, the Bible says his image was marred more than any man. He said, poor Jesus. No, that's a good thing. Because it was the marring of the image of the man of sin. That means that Jesus took that image that you have of yourself that wrong image and beat it up. Yeah. Amen. You know, in plastic surgery, like if they're gonna, you know, do a surgery on your nose, they first have to break your nose and reset it. You gotta make over. Do you understand? 
He broke your nose, he busted your face up, and he's caused you to receive a resurrected image. You see that? But how does that happen? In your heart, the Holy Spirit begins to show you that you're not that old person. He begins to beat that old man out of you. How? With his word. Just talking to you. Do you understand? His word will put you to death. His word will kill everything in you that you don't like about yourself. Yeah. Wow.